you suppose? You have to, did you start it? I think so. Okay. We didn't hear the message that we need to start it usually. Oh, change your setting there. Which one? That. You said, did you, the, there's a lot of them there. That one. Which one's that to the, drop it on your speaker. That top one? No, 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 no. Yeah, the top one there. No? How do you know? Well, you don't want to hear me here, do you? Well, we wouldn't hear you, but if that way, if like Lori chimes in. Oh, yes. I like Lori. And we can hear fine yes, online. <laughs> Whoa! Jesus sounds like Lori. <laughs> All right, I don't think you're shit. Are you I'm sharing? not sharing my screen, no. No, it's a, I don't know. I'm not seeing the screen, correct. Wait, why are you viewing my screen? Hold on. Computers are hard. Hey, there we go. All right, now you can show your screen. We <laughs> made it all the way to class 11 before you. How did you, how did you do that? How did you? I was the. How did you share my screen? I gave you permission. Looks like he's in charge here. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's in charge. There you go. All right. Here we are. <sighs> Welcome. It's Monday. How'd you like the weather this weekend? Nice, awesome. right? It's beautiful. We had to cover our plants. I got up this morning, it was 34 degrees. Sorry, my dogs got in through the plastic fencing that we had and dug up like almost everything. I was so not happy. <laughs> dogs. Who chose to have the dogs? Yeah, see? All right, I can't answer that question. Same thing with my wife. We have three little dogs like this and they pee, you know, mm -hmm. and stuff. And I was anti, I mean, I've had dogs. I finally hit was rid of dogs and you know we're getting rid of children now i got one child left and i was like we're, we're close my wife is oh we should get a dog i'm like no we shouldn't you know oh we should get a dog i'm like no we shouldn't so she gets one dog pees everywhere i told you i don't want to. so she she knows that too i don't even have to say it anymore <laughs> yeah and then and then the second one i got i picked that one so whatever but that one doesn't pee so no, does, does, I mean, the dog doesn't, yeah, it doesn't even pee. doesn't eat. <laughs> it's robotic. It's just, yeah. And then the, the third dog, then my wife had to get a third dog. So, and that one, that one is Albert. Albert is just likes to mark everything. Pees on everything. All right, so here we are. We got uh, plenty of time. So you want the good news or the bad news? Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, for you, the bad news, the Packers aren't going to make the playoffs this year. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you said it was bad news. For, for him, it's bad news. Right. Yeah, for us. No, I don't know. Uh, so, well, I miscounted. This is, we're going to get through the book today. This is class 11. I, I thought we were going to get through the book in class 12, but we're going to get through the book today in class 11, which means our next class will be testing, review. Uh, are you guys all pretty much caught up with the book? 70%. Yeah. Okay. And as you're reading, are you encountering anything that's not making sense? You know, it all seems to logically kind of flow and fit together. Because if it doesn't, then, you know, take notes and bring them to class so we can mm -hmm. talk about why it is. It, it seems to make a lot more sense when you understand the why behind certain things but we'll uh we'll get through tonight uh and 22nd i'll he won't be here i'll be here we'll just do practice tests together and then we were planning on the 29th and i just found out that i'll be in new jersey on the 29th so smoking mm. is going to be funky yeah because i won't be here all day either so we'll figure it out we'll figure out something because the last one we'll just party yeah. sorry for the online people what? Sorry to the online people. Well, I heard that uh, Brad, uh, Brandon was getting requests for like, hey, Evan said something about food 
Can you come in? <laughs> <laughs> of course you can. We'll figure it out. Because even if we run out of food, we can get more. Uh, so maybe we'll figure. Do Tuesdays or Thursdays work for anybody? As of tomorrow, no. As of tomorrow, no. I start the master's degree at the U of M in security. Oh, nice. There's there's a request online for you guys to barbecue. Yeah, I'm thinking no on like Tuesday or Thursday, but that's not going to work. I mean, you guys can do it still. No, well, but I like you. You've been in the front row the whole class. Yeah. It's, it's worth something. <laughs> well, he fell asleep a couple times. You couldn't see it. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll figure something out for that last, the last, last class. So we will have class on Wednesday, but Wednesday will be all review. We'll go through quiz questions together. It'll be fun. You'll need to give me your login. Yep. To your bank account. Yep. Right on it. Okay. Spring 2019. Huh? Yeah. Spring 2019. Catholic. No, spring 2015. I haven't changed my password. Come on. <laughs> oh, it's <been> four years. <laughs> that's awesome. All right, let's get through it. Uh, so check in. Uh, well, that's what we're doing, I guess. Uh, do you guys listen to our podcast? Sometimes? You guys uh, yeah. Not yet. It was a pretty good one. We talked about the, our week last week. So last week was crazy. We had five talks, four conferences, the two classes, and a panel. It was interesting. So it was just a weird week. It was just really busy. Oh, I shared it with you. You already have it in last pass. Okay. And Thursday, I think I'll be in Denver at the ISSA doing a three-hour incident management workshop. So it'll be fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, any, you guys got anything exciting going on? How many are you all working in security? Any of you working in security now? Okay. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah, Next sort of. Job. Next job? Yeah. So you're going to get your master's? Yeah. Do we have to bow to you then? Uh, no, that's what the PhD will be for. Then people can join Dr. Paul. Right. There you go. <laughs> Eric Cole. Dr. Eric Cole. You heard, you heard of Eric Cole? I've seen some of his webinar stuff on yeah. Virginia. He got really salesy now, mm -hmm. but he used to be somebody that I watched a lot and mm -hmm. uh, followed a lot when he was with Sands more. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so chapters one through eight questions. I got 122 slides to go through. Um, what else did I write over there? Another laid back class, reinforcement. There's just some key concepts tonight. Uh, we're going to get through software development. We're going to finish up. Uh, chapter seven uh, or chapter eight, domain seven. I'm going to finish that and then get into chapter nine, domain eight, uh, and we'll finish that, which is the software development stuff. So pretty, pretty easy. All right. So what type of backup is typically obtained during an, a response, aka? That's short for also known as a D binary. Binary. Yeah. That's true. So you need that bit level binary copy. It'd be a forensic copy. So so they'll use those terms interchangeably, binary copy, uh, block level copy, uh, forensic copy. Those are all basically the same. What is the primary goal of disaster recovery planning, DRP? Integrity of data, preservation of business capital, restoration of business processes, safety of personnel. D. Yeah, even though it's that's sort of a funny question because it's like business continuity is usually that. DRP is usually more short-term business or IT specific. So rarely do you really see a lot of safety of personnel stuff in a true DRP. Usually you'd see those in the BCP or continuity of operations plan, one of those two. I actually had a discussion just today with uh, somebody who's been in information security for quite a long time. Uh, I'm, I've been tasked to rewrite or review, rewrite their DRP and uh, it gave me the plan. It's a business continuity. Oh, what was it? But it was business continuity something and disaster recovery plan. Mm -hmm. And I was like, do you want me to, you know, well, first, I, I don't know. First I said, do you, uh, is that intentional? And they're like, well, yeah. 
like, okay, uh, but those are different plans. And then explain to them why the plans are different. And they started to kind of like get defensive. And I was like, no, 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 I'm just asking because if you want me to write the DRP, we can do that because I don't have to, you know, you are the right people to help me, you know, sponsor that. But if you want me to write the BCP, well, then that's different, right? We have a lot more work to do. But it was interesting how, you know, this person has, you know, 25 years-ish of probably information security experience. So you just don't take that stuff for granted. You know, we were talking about that yeah. this morning, too, in our, in our yeah. webinar. And it's not like he's a bad security person. It's just sometimes we take a lot of things for granted. I do it. You do it. You know. But knowing the difference between DRP and BCP, those are those two are definitely going to be examinable. What business process can be used to determine the outer bound of a maximum tolerable downtime? See. Uh, accounts receivable, invoicing, payroll, shipment of goods. See? Yeah. He's got to pay people. They won't come. Your maximum tolerable downtime is 40, 48 hours. What is the most cost-effective alternate site choice? Cold, hot, redundant, warm. Warm? Warm. Warm, warm. yeah. Cold site, it's weeks. Hot site, hours. Redundant is seconds, minutes, nothing. And then warm is, yeah, usually two to four days. A structured walkthrough test is also known as what kind of test? Checklist, simulation, tabletop exercise, walkthrough drill. Tabletop. 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 <clears throat> there you go. What type of backing or backup will include only those files that have changed since the most recent full backup? B. Differential, yeah. And the incremental would back up everything that's been backed up since last full backup, but not since last oh. any backup. No. no. The incremental is any backup, differential is since That's what I got it wrong. Yeah, yeah, you thank it. you. I got it mixed up. My bad. Thank you. My brain's breaking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is where we're at, Chapter 8, Domain 7, page 411. Executive succession planning. Uh, so it, this is obviously something you, you want to take. You can't assume that your CEO, your CFO, even your controller potentially, will be available in the event of a disaster. So who's going to make what calls when and those types of things. So that's one part of executive succession planning. The other is about to die, right? We have to do that here. Like we, there's a plan. If if I die, there's a plan. There's uh, it's curl up in the corner in the fetal position. No, no, no. It's uh, but we have insurance because I know that this part of the plan we have insurance. You, there's in a lot of companies there's key man insurance if you have you know key people uh, and then what that insurance money will be spent on is also accounted for in the succession planning part of that is appointing here it's appointing uh, a, a commission a committee to find a new or replacement CEO the other part of that plan is potentially to do it from within but but so we have our own succession plan here. Uh, you know, the second one is sort of, that second bullet point is a little, like it's, it's best not to have your key executives traveling to the same place, the same way, at the same time. It's pretty rare though. I mean, it would suck, I guess, if you had a plane with all, you know, your whole management team go down and mm -hmm. now the company I don't know. So I guess it's a good good point. But like I'll be traveling a lot this uh, third fourth quarter with uh, John Herman, who's the president of FR Secure. So you'll have he and I hand in hand everywhere, and you have yeah. the CEO <laughs> and the president all over the place together. I guess it's not a good best practice. But Renee would kick butt. We'll be better off. Exactly. So, <laughs> that's because I report for That's a thing too. You want to make sure you don't have too much key man insurance. <laughs> it might be worth more debt. <laughs> there, there was a time when that was that was true, and I was like, that huh, seems like a lot of money. 
Right, so who gets a red eye flight and who gets some normal morning flight? Well, I'm going to pull rank for sure. Yep. <laughs> Founder's privilege. Yep. Yep. All right. So you get the plan done. You have session planning. You have all this stuff in there in your plan. He went through uh, last Wednesday how to build a lot of the plan. We also talked about that this morning because mm -hmm. you gave a talk last week on disaster recovery planning. Uh, but at the end of it, then it has to be approved, right? And so in as explicitly as possible because you want somebody to sign off because you don't want me – somebody has to defend the plan, right? If uh, if you do have a disaster and you're doing things and they say, well, who approved that? It's like, you know, it's good to have that approval documented. Uh, senior management, CEO, sometimes the board approves disaster recovery plans as high up as you can go, you know. Uh, CIO is probably the most common though, maybe CFO. Backups and availability, you know, make sure that you have your backups available. You know, make sure you know where they are, make sure you know that they've been tested. It seems like I saw something somewhere about what percentage of people actually test their backups. I think it was on Twitter. Somebody was following on Twitter and it was like in the 30s, 30%-ish 30 of people actually test their backups to make sure that they're available. In case of a disaster, how often would you say you've run into that, where people actually oh, do test them? Uh, it's pretty rare. And what they'll say typically when you ask that question, you know, do you test your backups? Like, well, yeah. I'm like, well, how do you test it? Well, well we somebody, restore files when people lose yeah. them. Well, that's a different kind of test, right? That's that's when you find out it's not actually right. doing it. Yep. So make sure you, you know, it sucks when in a disaster is when you find out your backups aren't available. Your backups won't work. If your backups are, you know, if you're doing online backups, well, then make sure you're going to have network connectivity so you can pull those backups down. If you can't get network connectivity, then is there an alternative way for whoever the backup vendor is to get the backups to you? Can they put it on tape and, you know, and send it along with a, with a tape library so you can restore it that way, right? So having those things figured out and worked out is really important. I mentioned before having that, that backup key, you know, if your backups are encrypted, which is a good best practice, uh, Where's the key stored? Having it stored with the backup or having it stored on the same server as the backup, you know, the backup server and get that server goes down. I mean, you just think of, you know, how you get that that data decrypted. Meantime, if the mean time to recovery is greater than the mean time or maximum tolerable downtime, then an alternate backup or availability methodology. So that'll all be driven by your business impact analysis. When you do your business impact analysis, you'll just have to meet the the requirements is given by the business and it's their job to it's sort of your job too but it's it's together it's justifying the budget for those things right if you do a business impact analysis and they tell you that it's that you tell them what's going to cost this much money to give you that that's easier usually for budget for you know than having a security guy just tell you you need it i was just asked this morning too about <clears throat> how much should you spend on information security Whatever it takes. It's a good question, though. I mean, yeah. on average per capita, what should you spend? Because the thing is, as Drew said, that I told him $500 a person. I'm like, where did the hell? I think Drew's making stuff up because he's a salesperson. It sounds. Where would, I come, where, would I, where would I come up with $500 a person? It's on the financial sector, it's three grand per person. Really? It's ridiculous. Usually, like I've seen 8 to 13% of IT budget. It's pretty, you know, pretty common. IBM did a study last year, and it was eight. They recommended eight to thirteen percent of IT budget. Huh. I know it seems like expensive, five hundred bucks. A, yeah. Well, maybe not. It, but that's so dependent on the you, size of the organization. If you have ten employees, five thousand dollars probably isn't mm -hmm. enough. Right. But if yeah. you have ten thousand employees, over fifty million, five million, it's probably plenty. Back in the day, uh, on the network side of things, when you had um, failover networks and such like that, they never got tested. And then when you needed them, they weren't there. Yeah, the times they didn't work. Yeah, it stinks. That's just how people are. But uh, set aside time. The company, the organizations that have been burned before, find ways to test in the future. Mm -hmm. You know, big banks always test. Hard copy data. Talked about this as well. You know. It's not uncommon 
I think hospitals are probably the closest to this still because they're still sort of not fully electronic. You know, they've and they're the closest to in time wise of not being electronic. So they can still do a lot of the paper processes and things like that and get away with it. Uh, but think about how you can run your business potentially without IT if you had to. You know, how long could that go? Uh, electronic backups, full backups. We've talked about what a full backup is, an incremental backup, differential backups. You should all be pretty clear on what those things are. Now, if I want to restore, say I do backups daily. I do, say Sunday nights, I do full backups, and then every day I do a differential. The server goes down on Thursday. How many backup tapes would I need to recover? Differential? Yeah. Two? Exactly. Well, two well, sets of Two tapes. sets. But those are the types of questions you'd see, where as opposed to incremental, I would need four. I, I need the full, or full and then the incrementals, because they stack up on each other. Now, why would I run an incremental versus a differential? Speed. Speed. The amount time. of data that changes daily. Yeah, storage media. Yeah. So there are reasons why I would run incrementals, but the trade-off is it's going to take more time to restore that data. If you're doing it more frequently, you can want to do incrementals and differentials. Yeah, you can switch them all up if you want to. It, I would suggest <clears throat> not doing it. It's really confusing it when does. you need to restore. <laughs> it gets it gets out of hand pretty quick because you're not usually thinking all that much when management's calling you every five minutes. So How I mean, much longer? How much longer? If you're doing it every four hours, you would want to do incrementals instead of the differentials of the background. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Electronic vaulting is just having, it, it is what it says it is. It's essentially having your data in a vault. Uh, and it's happening regularly, right? Shorter time intervals. Uh, yeah, makes it easier. And this is probably the most common now. Like, when we use uh, Office 365 and use OneDrive, mm -hmm. that's that's vaulting, you know, very short time intervals. It's syncing as I'm writing almost. Uh, makes it a lot easier to recover that sort of data. Remote journaling. So the key word there is remote journaling. So this is written somewhere else, not the same physical server. So the database journal can, is really a transaction log things that typically haven't been committed to the database, uh, as well as things that have been written to the database for remote journaling to work right. Uh, use to recover of database failure, checkpoints, journals, that's good enough. Database shadowing is having a separate copy of the database. Uh, this is sometimes used as a redundancy feature as well, right? So in an active passive configuration, the one that's passive would be the shadowed database would so be the that's where the shadow is to know we're yeah have it active passive at the data center and then the passive one replicates to the hot site yep for even more yep yep yeah because databases typically have like the keys to the kingdom right I mean that's the that's the and that's where all of the, the best data is right and usually you know it's driving something on the front end some kind of business transaction thing so Definitely want to have redundancy there and not, not that's one place you don't want to go cheap on backups is your databases. Software escrow. So a software escrow, when you have the software that, you, have, you know, if you're outsourcing your software development to somebody, this is the most common place to use software escrow. So I have a company that I've hired to, to do software development for me. I may demand or write in, in the contract that we need to do a software escrow. So they'd store the code with the escrow holder, and then given these certain things that happen in the contract, they would release the code to me as the owner, right? And I would do that to protect against disputes with the software developer, or the software developer goes out of business, and I can't get my code. See, if I'm running you know, an application where I don't have the source code, that's an orphaned application. I can't update it anymore. I can't add new features to it anymore. Uh, so software escrow is really popular. If you're doing any outsourced software development and it's important enough software, pay for the escrow. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, DRP testing, training, and awareness. So 
people do skip these steps. So the first bullet point, skipping these steps, is one of the most common BCP DRP mistakes. Either that or keeping, we'll, we'll go through what the BCP DRP mistakes are, but another real common one is they don't, you don't keep it up to date. But testing is at least, an, let's say you do annual tests, that means at least annually you would think you would update your disaster recovery plan for actually testing it, right? So you'd catch up on all those changes that had happened in the environment since the last time it was updated. Assuming you didn't have your disaster recovery plan integrated with change control, it would be more ideal to have it integrated with change control, right? So you do these things and then update the disaster recovery plan, update diagrams, what have you. Uh, but tech people don't. I don't know why they don't test them. Why would you? Why do you think that is? It's hard. It's not though. It's not going to happen. You can get. Yeah. You can just get the disaster recovery team sit around a table, spend an afternoon, pay for lunch. Let's do a tabletop. Understaffed, you can't. I suppose. But you're giving, them, you're giving them lunch. You can. People always find time when you give them lunch. Lunch and drinks. Party. With one of those disco balls that goes around. In there. That would totally get them to come. <laughs> Sometimes you have to incent people to come and yeah. do testing. Uh, but testing it really is important. It, it uh, even if you're just doing a tabletop test, uh, it gets you thinking through all these different scenarios. Uh, yeah. Make sure it's viable for recovery, routine infrastructure. So. That's what I was just saying about keeping the disaster recovery plan up to date with new things that have happened in the environment. Tied in with change control, too, if you can. Uh, e efficacy, that's a hard word. And, uh, yeah, minimum of an annual basis. I've seen some people do it quarterly. We did it quarterly. Yeah. That's a different system every quarter. Quarterly is not a bad idea. Right, especially if you, because then you get, you just get into a cycle, you get into a routine, and it almost becomes business as usual to just test your disaster recovery plan. Yeah. <clears throat> and then when the disaster recovery, when the disaster comes, it's not a big deal. It's like second nature. Everybody's like, oh, I got this. It's a lot different than like people like, what the hell's that plan? Crap. We did what are we supposed to do? Where's the transfer switch for each the generator? Quarter, somebody else would be responsible for bringing <clears throat> it up. Yeah. So you'd have everybody on the team trained. You didn't have to wait a year. And it wasn't totally disrupted to the business. That's true. Mm -hmm. So this is one type of test, just a DRP review. We just sit around and we just read it. You can read it together, read it, and then come together after you've all read it, whatever. <clears throat> but it's really just reading it, making sure that it's a logical, it's a good logical flow through uh, through the plan. Um, you're not really talking through any scenarios or anything like that. It just reviewing the plan, updating it, update the date on the plan. That's one of the bad things about DRP review. <clears throat> it's because people will say that they reviewed it, but they didn't really review it. Imagine that. Are you saying people don't like to sit and read a mm -mm. DRP? They don't. Because I've seen so many disaster recovery plans where all they did in the whole review was update the date. Last reviewed. Change it to today's date, and that's it. Put it back on the shelf. Nobody actually looked at it. So you look at the con you can look at the disaster recovery plan from four years ago, five years ago, and the disaster recovery plan that's current. It's the same the damn same. plan. Nothing changed in four or five years. So that does happen. Oh. That's the one bad thing about review. If you are going to review it, actually review it. The checklist is just going through and making sure that the plan has the, the proper things in it that it should have, like. Uh, you know, it's got a policy statement in it. It's got the disaster recovery team. It's got the phone numbers. It's got the this and that. It's just a checklist. If it has all the necessary components in it, uh, this is also not typically not one that is done. One, it's not typically done by itself. Usually, it's a part of another type of test. And two, uh, it doesn't it doesn't ensure that the plan is actually going to work. Right? It's just a it doesn't have the things it's supposed to have in it. But that's a different type of test. It's the checklist. Uh, the other tests, which I don't know if we even get to, are the the walkthrough, the tabletop exercises. Those are usually pretty good. That's when you would get people ordering lunch and have people sit around the table and talk through maybe a scenario or two about, all right, tornado hits right outside, takes out whatever. We have no power and no electricity. And then talk through how you would handle that, you know. 
Sally, you're going to handle PR. You're going to handle communications. You're going to handle whatever. Uh, parallel processing is you're simulating a disaster. You're basically <clears throat> running in two different places. There's no interruption to the business. You're just running twice. You would do this in places where you've got like a hot site or you know some place where you can run two productions at the same time. Uh, yeah, not a real popular test, but because it's expensive, you'd have to have redundant systems to do a parallel test. Partial and complete business interruption. These are also not popular tests because <laughs> those are, people, those are stressful tests. People, people get scared <laughs> when you do these kinds of tests, but they're the best tests. They're the most thorough test, right? Because you're actually going to you're going to take the test through and actually walk it through, like do it. Uh, so we're going to powers off. So somebody goes to the breaker even and shuts down the breaker, you know, and then people go to their right places, the right stations and do it. You normally would do these on like weekends and stuff like that. And you plan it really, really, really well, because if it's not planned well and you can't bring it back up again, ma executive management's going to be really mad. But usually they're involved too, right? You would see this uh, uh, bigger corporations, like American Express used to do these quite a bit. Uh, they would fail over, um, do a full interruption test. But yeah, it's, it's, it's the best, it's the best, most accurate test, but it's also the riskiest. Training, everybody should be trained on the disaster recovery plan. Everybody who has a specific role in the disaster recovery, meaning your disaster recovery team, your disaster recovery team, is it's not all that unlike an, an incident response team where I've got somebody who leads the team, right? They've got uh, somebody who's in charge of communications. I like to have in my in, in most plans, somebody who's in charge for internal communications and somebody who's in charge of external communications. That means if there's anything that comes from anywhere external, like the media, the new, uh, you know, news, uh, shareholders, whatever, they handle, every, they all have to go through them. And I also like to have backups. So if that person's not available, who's the backup? So usually legal, right? So if you have a PR team, the PR team would handle the external communications and the backup would be legal. So they're the only two people that are permitted at any time to talk about disasters with anybody outside of the organization. So I mean, yeah. So I, I like plans like that because it's really clear, crystal clear. It also makes, it, it's a nice thing for, I don't want to talk to the media. You know, so if they ask me to talk, I, I can't plan. You know, it's nice to have that as backup. Uh, so having those <clears throat> those roles specifically defined, every one of those roles requires some level of training. And then everybody in the whole organization requires training, right? Yes, we have a disaster recovery plan. This is how it works. This is how you would find out about it. You know, you'd probably get a call and this is what it would sound like. Because you'd also want to do a call tree test, right? You want to make sure that the call tree is actually going to work the way it's going to work and, you know, all that stuff. So everybody, everybody gets training. Uh, starting emergency power, that you're going to do this as part of your normal, you know, usually once a month, you know, you go and start the generator. Yeah. You know, make sure that it's going to run and you'll probably do maintenance on the generator. Depending on what type of generator you have, you'll probably do it every six months, once a year, we had whatever. a generator at a place, and we had a ticket that, was, you know, every week had to go out and check the right. oil and fuel, or the fuel and oil levels. Yeah. And they'd been checked off, and we went to go run it in a DR, and it was, like, an eighth of a tank. Like, what the? We went back and looked, and it said, full, 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 full. Nobody was actually checking it. They the, were just, they were just off. signing off <clears> on it. The, that, but you had accountability at least at that point to go and say, what the hell? <laughs> what the hell? Well, that's straight up lying. Yeah. 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 It's usually Not, termination time. Yeah. It's, yeah. Bummer. Well, now and nowadays, you know, most, I mean, all your emergency power is pretty much automated, right? It usually goes from uh, normal power, switch over to UPS. There's usually a time for UPS for your generator to start up if you've got a diesel generator. Then you've got an automatic transfer switch, so you don't even have to switch it anymore. It just goes right over to diesel. There's all kinds of different generators. Right. Uh, so starting emergency power, it's good to test that. Uh, yeah. And then training on what if it doesn't start? You know, who are you going to call if, if, yeah. your, if your generator doesn't start? And, 
you know, if it's a widespread enough disaster, uh, it might be hard to get a service person out. So do you want to have a service person maybe, you know, at least somebody who's got some remedial training on how to troubleshoot, you know, the basic stuff on a cat motor, something like that. More training, there's the calling tree training test. And, and truly in, in like real life, if you've got any organization like bigger than like 50 employees, I would go with an automated calling tree. I don't know why anybody would rely on a human calling tree. It's just so so prone to errors. So, but you know, e either one, test them. Awareness, so this is where you, you know, maybe keeping people like in certain parts of the country, uh, like Florida, right? There's a hurricane season. Usually there's an awareness campaign, you know, around that time of year. Hey, it's hurricane season. Have you, you know, do you know where your disaster recovery plan is? Do you, you know, evacuation routes, stuff like that. So that's so that's the awareness piece. Continued BCP DRP maintenance. I mentioned already before, you know, the integration with change management. If you if you are an organization that has a lot of changes to technology, some organizations don't change much. But if you have if you're a dynamic organization where technology is changing a lot. You may not be able to wait till the next test to start, you know, to update your disaster recovery plan. You might, you know, integrating with change control would be a good thing. Another thing I like about change control is it makes people think twice about doing changes. Sometimes people just like to do changes. You know, you ever met those people? They just like to change stuff, like all the time. So at least if I have change control, I make them <laughs> fill out some documentation. I make them think about it. I make them do a backup plan. They're like. I don't, it's not worth it. Yes, it's not worth it. <laughs> Thank you. So it's a good thing about change management. All right, so common mistakes, lack of management support. You could get fired if you don't, if you spend enough money on the disaster recovery plan without executive management buy-in. That could be, that could get you in a lot of trouble. Lack of business unit involvement. This is one of the things I think is, because it's, actually pretty rare to find a good disaster recovery plan that's backed up with a business impact analysis. You know, because in order for me to do a business impact analysis, I have to actually go out and talk to the business, right? They're the ones who tell me how important these systems are. I don't tell them how important these systems are. I'm a custodian. They're the owner. So my talk from last week. Was it? Exactly See? that. That's because you and I are on the same page. Uh, so business unit involvement is really important. It's the business that runs on your stuff. Uh, lack of prioritization among critical staff. Uh, you just have to beat them into shape, I suppose. Improper, uh, often overly narrow scope. We see that a lot too, and it, that would be driven by the why, typically. Why are you doing a disaster recovery plan? If the purpose for doing your disaster recovery plan is to be HIPAA compliant, well, then you're going to narrow the scope as narrowly as possible, right? So I can check the box or GDPR or whatever, PCI. So if the scope, whereas if the scope is truly I want to provide the most value I can to the business and manage risk well, that would be a different scope typically, right? I, I'd want to I can incorporate as much as I possibly can into this. So if it's too narrowly, if it's too narrowly scoped, then I'll only recover those systems potentially that are in scope. Right? And I might leave critical systems out. Inadequate telecommunications management. Uh, you're really kind of handcuffed usually with telecommunications management because there's only so many providers in the area that can provide you telecommunications. So you have to think of other out of band types of communications, you know, whether it be cell phone, whether it be even satellite, microwave. Uh, there's a microwave antenna right over here in, in the corner of the building if you want to see what one of those looks like. But microwave is line of sight communication. Um, you got to think through all those things. Inadequate supply chain management, having things get here. Uh, incomplete or inadequate crisis management plan. Uh, lack of testing, lack of training and awareness, and failure to keep the plan up to date. That's, and I made that one bold, underlined in different color, the last one. Any questions on that? Seems pretty straightforward and I get uh, a lot of the things I mean actually when you think about security most of the things we do are pretty damn straightforward I think it's just that that a lot of times they're work 
right? Yeah. And I, I think people don't like to work, to be honest. Like asset management, you know. I, like the talks last week, I'm talking to a bunch of security people, and they're all like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, how many of you do it? You all agree with me, but yet you're not doing it. It's, disaster recovery is kind of the same thing. It's work. Handful of specific frameworks. So these are frameworks, and you will have to m memorize the frameworks and maybe just the basic basics about these frameworks for the test. NIST SP 800-. So remember the NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology. SP stands for Special Publication. There's the 800 series. 800-34 is the one for BCP and DRP. That publication has actually been rescinded. There's a new one, but for the test, this is the one. Uh, so 800-34, Contingency Planning for Information Technology Systems. It's origi it was originally developed for non-classified government systems, but it's still really good guidance for all systems. Uh, and there's a download link there if you want to actually read it. Uh, ISO 27031, so this is part of the ISO 2700 series. So we have 2701, 2701, 2700, which is for the ISMS, right? That we would use that for certification. ISO 27002, which is management techniques for ISMS. We have 27005, which is risk management. Now we have 27031, which is D DRP. Now it seems like I'm missing one or two, but you'll need to you'll need to know those numbers. Those are all testable. The ISO, which ISO ones do what? Uh, yeah. Focuses on BCP. DRP is handled in another framework. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ISO is good. Good in general. ISO is pretty good guidance because it's uh, it's more business friendly than NIST. NIST is a little more prescriptive, a little more rigid. And CSF isn't that good. No, CFS is real, CSF but, is yeah. real loose. I guess from the BCP side though. Yeah, I'm talking about the yeah, special publications too. Yeah. Yeah, the framework is nice, but the framework yeah. is also not nice because how do you True. measure yourself against it and all this other stuff? That's what people get. Yeah, lost. minor details. True that. Measure yourself. True Who does that? that? True that. Uh, so two, so there's ISMS, that's our information security management system. It's the same reference ISMS that's in 27001, same thing. Uh, but then we've got information and, control and communications technology, ICT, uh, that's also used sort of throughout, but um, called out maybe a little more specifically in this document. Now, this isn't a free document. All the ISO standards you have to pay for. So I wouldn't be able to give you a link to actually go and look at it. But that's a link to go buy it. I wouldn't suggest buying it. You don't need to buy it for the test. If you're going to be building a disaster recovery plan, then maybe you go ahead and invest in it. But that's what that link is. We got BS, stands for British Standards, not what you thought it stood for. Uh, 25999, this is just the, you'll need to know the number, that it's a disaster recovery plan. Uh, probably a good idea to know. No, you don't need to know the British Standards Institution, that what BSI stands for, but that there's two parts to it. And this one, I, I don't think this one's free either. I can't remember. And then BCI, Business Continuity Institute. This one is, is actually <clears throat> pretty well accepted because it's an institute. It's a bunch of business continuity professionals and disaster recovery planning professionals who belong to this institute and they're dedicated to that. So what you'll need to know is the Business Continuity Institute, BCI, and good private uh, practice guidelines, GPG. Uh, and you probably need to know that there's six guidelines. Two are management practices, the four are the techno technical practices. Good enough. That's it, chapter seven. Domain seven in the bag. Pretty pretty easy, yeah? Straightforward. A lot of probably memorization, but it all makes pretty logical sense, I think. Do you guys have any questions about any of that? <clears throat> okay. 
We could take a break. Hell no. I don't take breaks. He does. No, he doesn't either. None of us do. Page 429. So software development security, understanding, applying, and enforcing software security. Any are you guys, any of you guys software developers? All right. So a lot of this will be a, sort of a different language. That's okay. You don't have to be a software developer to pass the exam. You just you'll have to some things to memorize. If you wanted to learn software development, uh, I'd say Python is probably the most <coughs> common right now. Security <coughs> people. And it's pretty straight. Python is pretty uh, easy to use. It's forgiving, which is also the bad thing about it. It's forgiving. You code something that you didn't mean to happen. The last domain, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Programming concepts, application development methods, databases. Uh, I think I believe the plural for database is data by. I'm going to call it data by. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard that. But... It makes stuff up. You're an author. You can do that. It's yeah. true. I am an author. The words are mine. I own them. The words are my uh, minions. Object-oriented design and programming, assessing the effectiveness of software security and then artificial intelligence. Now, we're not going to go deep into artificial intelligence. We're just going to cover like three different types of artificial artificial intelligence. that will be more than enough for you to pass the exam. Because artificial intelligence, we could get mired in that for days, mm -hmm. especially nowadays because it sells a lot of product. Uh, unique terms and definitions, extreme programming. The, the one thing to remember about extreme programming is pairs of developers. It's two pairs of developers. The specs are really tight. Um, but that, that would be extreme programming. Think pairs of developers. Uh, object, a black box, means the things that happen within the, the object are encapsulated within the object. So other objects may not necessarily know or the rest of the program won't even know necessarily what's in the object in terms of data or you know instructions. But so that's that's when it says it's a it's a black box. Object oriented program programming is just using objects. It's much more efficient to do typically uh, object oriented programming because I can reuse objects. I can write an object and I can reuse it in different programs. It's very flexible, modular, those are all good things in application development. Uh, procedural language. Procedural is just like a procedure. It's the same sort of thing. It's step by step instructions, you know, in the program. Uh, organized into subroutines, functions. Uh, but procedural languages are, uh, I think, a third generation language. We'll get to that in a minute. The spiral model is so there's different application development models. We talked about one already, and these are just unique terms and definitions at the beginning of the book. We're going to cover them again. We talked about extreme programming. That's one development model. The spiral model is another model that we'll talk about. It looks like a, what do you call this? Snail. Mm -hmm. It's like a snail. So we'll show you that. Systems development life cycle. So this is an overused term where I think it's so open. I mean, in some places, a system development life cycle means this. It's rigid, not rigid. It's well-documented, easy to follow. Then you've got other people, it's, it's like on a napkin. Developers are weird people in general. <coughs> um, <clears throat> most of them don't like documentation. What? No, it's true. Syst system development life cycle. So there's bunches of different kinds of system development life cycles. Uh, but I the, for the test, you want security in at the very beginning of a software development project and at checkpoints within the rest of uh, life cycle. And when you think of a life cycle, it's the same thing from initial, what would you call that first step? Uh, conception, uh, yeah. ideation, whatever, all the way through to decommission, right? The entire life cycle of, of the application. Waterfall model, uh, which is probably one of the easiest ones to recognize, but it's not functional. We'll go through that too. That's another software development. Uh, model. So, so far, and here are three of them, software develop, uh, waterfall model, the spiral model, and extreme programming are the three so far. We're also going to talk about some more. 
So capability maturity model, have you guys run into the capability maturity model before? Originally, this was the Software Engineering Institute, part of Carnegie Mellon, made this model uh, really for software development, I think it was what it was first used for, but now it's used for all kinds of things. It's the maturity of a process, maturity of a practice, maturity of an application. Mature, you, can, you can apply the same maturity model to just about anything. Um, the important thing about as a software development shop gets more and more mature, less and less errors happen. And an error is a, oftentimes a vulnerability, right? So then we have to patch it. So the more mature, the better. Programmers may make, on average, 15 to 50, to 50 errors per 1,000 lines of code. 1,000 lines of code is called a K-lock, K-L-O-C. So 15 to 50 errors per K-lock. <clears throat> Whereas supposedly, well, you can, uh, in a real mature software development, shop, you can get that down to as low as one error. You'll never get it to zero, ever, because humans are humans, which is one of this kind of, can become kind of the scary thing with artificial intelligence, because at the end, it's developed by humans, right? So in the code, there's going to be errors in that code. Yeah. And then I've heard, you know, well, then you just write, write a artificial intelligence to repair the artificial intelligence, and I'm like, well, but there'll be errors in that one too, all right? Yeah, and it's all coded by humans, which have yeah. a so I don't think you'll ever bias. Yeah, you'll ever take out. Is that what you think is happening to Boeing right now? Oh God, I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, what is it now? The landing gear? I don't know. They grounded that whole line of jets. So oh, the seven thirty seven Maxes. Maxes, yeah. Yeah, they did that because the like it was. The alarms are going off because I don't know what they but it needed a software update. Should. But yeah, I heard the that there's an, fixed everything. I heard that there was another thing that uh, on some planes with the landing gear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't hear that. See that? Yeah, we just saw that today, but I don't remember which airplanes or anything. But anyway, capability maturity model. There's five steps in the capability maturity model. This is just a website. Uh, you know what the webs, and that's probably old. So it used to be just CMM. Now they have CMMI. It's its own institute thing it's not as easy to find the stuff anymore either so the lowest level is one one is initial it's very little of anything it's very ad hoc it's very chaotic at that level all the way up to optimizing we're optimizing things are documented they're they're ultra repeatable and you're really focusing on just on you know minor tweaks just to make it even better and better and better so that's and, and then you sort of have everything in between now, you don't need to memorize this, but this is very applicable to your job job, too. Uh, so the theory around capability maturity model is if a control is fully implemented, it's at a level five, that there's no vulnerability there. Right? Now, vulnerabilities are important because vulnerabilities, where there's a vulnerability and an applicable threat, that's a risk. Right? So if it's at a five, then that doesn't really matter so much what the threats are. Right, because there's no vulnerability. Conversely, if it's at a one, meaning it, it, the control is almost completely ineffective, then any threat poses a risk. But also, if there's no threats, there's no risk. Does that, does that make sense? You see how they play with each other? So that's how I interpret, you know, when I apply capability maturity model to a lot of the security stuff that we do. Uh, so it's one of the key components of risk is vulnerability translated into maturity. Does that make sense? Okay. So I like the CM, CMM, CMMI. That's just another uh, diagram of the same thing, right? So on the bottom left there is initial. That's, that's one. And on the upper right is optimized five. Now it's optimizing. So they updated it. They made it current tense. All right. Any questions on that? You'll need to know capability maturity model. I don't know if you'll need to know each of the five steps, but it'd be good anyway, because this is very, very uh, applicable to normal work. Thank you. You'll probably want to know how to tell those steps apart, but not maybe the nitty gritty 
So they give you a, yeah. an example. You can tell what where they're at in the maturity model. Mm -hmm. A lot of organizations will just use the capability of the maturity model as risk. I, you know, I disagree with that, but you'll see risk assessments in real life where they'll score things just on a scale of one to five with the capability of maturity model. All right, different types of code, machine code. Machine code is like the machine code. The CPU is actually executing that code, very super duper lower level. Uh, ones and zeros usually represent in like hex. Uh, CPU dependent, so machine code on, you know, an, an x86 won't run on some ASIC system, you know, they're CPU dependent. Uh, very low level code. So at the end, so when you start with like a, a procedural language or an object oriented language, it has to get itself down into machine code and you'd usually compile the source code into machine code so that it could be executed on that system, right? Uh, so source code is what you'd see in your IDE or integrated development environment. If you do development, you're typing stuff and whatever you see in your IDE, your program, uh, your, what would be a visual, is Visual Studio still used? Yeah, that'd be an IDE, what you're typing in there or whatever, that's your source code that would need to be compiled into machine code because that's a that's not an interpretive language. Make sense? Machine code, source code? Okay. There's just an old Commodore, some machine code. It's not very human readable, right? As you get up in the generations of language, so that's how you can tell. So this would be a generation, a first generation language. As you get up in, in generations, it becomes closer and closer to human speak. That's how you can tell the different generations of languages. There's an IDE, the program that you're coding in, and then there's your uh, source code. Assembler, so assembly language, low-level computer programming language. Uh, you know, there's your very few instruction sets or instructions there. Uh, an assembler converts the assembly language into machine code or machine language so that it can run. Uh, compilers do the same thing, but they would do it with uh, other source code. Uh, C, basic, um, C, C sharp, C++, those are all compiled languages. So they compile into an EXE, right? An EXE, an executable file with DLLs and other supporting dynamic link library files and other supporting things that the EXE is going to call. That's a compiled application. That makes sense? Uh, interpreted languages, so interpreted languages are ones that require an interpreter to be running on the machine. Java is probably the most common. You have to have Java installed in your machine to run Java code because the Java that's installed in your machine is an interpreter, <clears throat> right? So Java is not compiled code. It's, uh, really, it's run at runtime, so it's, uh, it's an interpreted program. Whereas like C sharp is not interpreted. C sharp is compiled as two you know, different languages. Uh, bytecode is kind of what's happening when it's being interpreted, right? So it's, it's sort of like being compiled on the fly almost, right? It's uh, as it's being run, the interpreter is converting the code, the source code into machine code so that it can run. Right, but it's not compiled into a nice, neat package. It's one of the things that makes Java and you know, Python and other application programming, interpreted pro, uh, programming languages more popular is because I can run them anywhere. I can run them on a Linux machine. I can run them on a Mac. I can run them on a Windows machine as long as I have an interpreter. Whereas compiled code won't do that. I can pile it for Mac. I can pile another uh, program for Windows, I compile another program for Linux. All right, so programming language generations. So your first generation language mach machine code, very hard for humans to just read unless you've written a lot of this. Uh, assembly would be a second generation language, COBOL, C, and BASIC, would be third generation languages. And if you've seen those, that they're not uh, easily read either. Uh, and the language is just like any other language. It's like learning 
Russian, right? It's just that the computer speaks, or your, uh, the programming language is Russian. So you have to learn to speak Russian if you want to communicate with the, with the computer with that language. Fourth generation languages, Cold Fusion, Progress, 4GL, Oracle Reports. So these are getting much easier, much humaner to read, right? Further sort of away from the machine code. Those are just examples. I've got some other things there. Uh, natural language processing would be like a, almost, it's not really a, like Alexa, but it, it would work almost the same way. You would just, it's almost like English to write code, right? Python is actually pretty close to that, right? Uh, Non-procedural languages, application generation commands, blah, blah, blah. So those are generations of language. This one's a good one, too, for actual um, examples. So hex, assembly, C, Fortran. So C and Fortran are both procedural languages. Uh, Java, Ruby. Make sense? So what you need to know for the exam is the different generations of languages, you need to know the difference between comp compile, compiled code or compiler and interpreted code. Those are the two basic ways that you're going to get code to run on a computer. It's either going to be interpreted, it's going to be compiled. When it's compiled, it's, it's compiled into machine code. So it's, it's specific to that machine type, right? All right, other things, uh, computer-aided software engineering. This is sort of what it sounds like. It's the computer is, uh, provides the, the, the development environment and it's gonna assist you. So a lot of your integrated development environments do this. If you've ever used, uh, I don't know, whatever, Visual Basic, you know, and you're writing your programming language and you'll see, you know, squiggly lines because your syntax is wrong or you misspelled things or you forgot you know, to delineate your line, whatever, uh, that's computer aided. It, it's aiding you in how you're developing your software, right? Uh, different types of case software, tools, tools fit within workbenches and tools and workbenches fit within environments. So environment's a big thing. You've got tools and workbenches in your environment and then you only have tools within your workbench. Pretty simple. Uh, and that's case. So uh, top-down and bottom-up programming, I'm more of a top-down sort of guy, uh, where I try to think of what do I want this program to do, how do I want it to function, and then start filling in kind of the nitty-gritty, and then look for other reusable code from other developers that might fit pieces of development. I'm not a developer, I'm a hack. There's a difference. I mean, seriously, I hack crap together. My code is not efficient. It looks like crap. Never going to sell a dime. You know, same as Excel. Yeah, Excel is the same way. Well, because Excel's got Visual Basic built into it, so you can do all kinds of cool macro stuff. And yeah, it's ugly. Mine's not any better. No, but I'm a top-down guy. But you can also develop from the bottom up. That's you know, working with what you've got for functional sort of components and making the best of it to try to fit some kind of thing that you're trying to do. So two different types of or ways to approach uh, programming, I'm, I just think more top-down. Uh, C and other uh, you know, procedural languages are pretty much all top-down. But you can take like Python, Ruby, and other stuff and take little components and build it up, you know, like putting together a Lego set. Open and closed source software. So closed source means that I don't have any access to the source code, right? I can't make modifications. Open source means I have access to the source code. I can make the code do whatever I want. Now, just because something's open source doesn't mean that I have a license to make changes to the source code. It means I can see the open source and maybe other people can contribute to the open source, but there's other, there's still, that does, there's still licensing issues that I might have to contend with. So there's different types of open source licensing. Um, let's just be careful with that. Open source, uh, there's been a debate since like forever, what's more secure, open source or closed source? And it's it's a stupid debate. <laughs> there's open source software that's really insecure. There's closed source. So, I mean, it's just, it doesn't matter. 
Uh, but open source software is kind of cool because if you want to learn programming or you want to make something custom, you want to make it fit specifically to what you want it to do, or and strip out maybe some of the fat stuff and you know how to do that, open source is kind of a nice way to go sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, but most of us, like Windows is closed source, the whole office suite is all closed source. Uh, open source, a lot of times you'll find that, uh, what's the GitHub and then... Uh, What's the other place? SourceForge is a good place to find all kinds of things. Uh, so the different, now this is sort of licensing, but it's what the application will allow me to do. So there's free software, shareware, and crippleware. Most software, yeah, man, it's all over the place, really. But free software is means it's free, no charge for it. But there's different types of free. There's gratis and libre. Gratis means free as in beer. I can do whatever I want with it. I can even change it if I want to. Uh, whereas Libre is, it's free to use. Can't change it, can't resell it, right? It's just free to use it. So those are the two differences between, you know, in free software. You'll need to know the difference between gratis or gratis and Libre, uh, free software. Now, shareware, fully functional and uh Sometimes it, it begins to cripple over time, right? You start to re re lose um, functionality. Sometimes it just stops working altogether. Uh, there's all kinds of different ways that shareware works. Some shareware works indefinitely. Like uh, one of my favorite text editors, I still use this TextPad. You guys use TextPad? Like it's, it's shareware, but they never force you to pay for it. You know, you should. If you have a conscience and you're not evil, you'd pay for it. Uh, what's another one? Um, Notebook Plus Plus. Notebook Plus Plus. Uh, Paint.net I mm -hmm. use yeah. for a lot of uh, stuff like that. Yeah. Putty. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And, I, <clears throat> and I'm going to full confession, I never paid for Putty. But I do pay for the other ones. I figure, man, there's a developer somewhere who's starving who needs a few bucks because, you know, Saves, saves, me, saves me a lot of time to edit stuff. House. What's that? This is big Malibu house. Hey, whatever, man. <laughs> I just don't feel like, I'm like one of those guys too, where it's like nothing really should be for free, right? Somebody somewhere did something. I don't know. It's, it's an Evan thing. Crippleware, uh, this means it's partially functioning, and then when you pay for it, you'll get an unlock key or something, and it'll open up the rest of the features for you. Software licensing, uh, we all read and use the license agreements. I'm sure you're supposed to. There's actually a test on line, what's line 34, paragraph 2? No, page 34, paragraph 2, line 6, word 7 in the Microsoft Excel and user license agreement. So you'll need to know that for the exam. Is. Is, yeah, it is. Dollar, dollar sign. Uh, so most software closed and open source is protected. So even most closed or, or open source software has a license associated with it. It might be an open license, like uh, GPL, the GNU uh, license, or public license. Uh, it might be common uh, Creative Commons. I mean, there's, there's BSD, there's other licenses. Uh, yeah. Copyright, so those closed source software and proprietary software will have an end user license agreement that most people just click through, you know, scroll and click and, you know, I wonder, yeah, I don't, I don't think that they can take your kid or anything. If, you, if they had that in there, I'd probably be able to fight that. I don't, I don't know. I wonder what I've agreed to on all these years and all those end user license agreements. So Creative Commons, and you can see that this, the, our slide decks are all Creative Commons, so... Um, you can go there and create your own uh, license for free and then put it on stuff, you know, maybe that you've created, stuff that you want to share. Because sometimes people are, like sometimes our slide decks, people, hey, can I, can I reuse your slide deck, you know, for a presentation or whatever. And a lot of times, you know, I'll put the Creative Commons stuff on there so they know how they can use it. Because... Sometimes you want them to use it, but not for commercial purposes. That's one that you can choose. Sometimes you want them to use it, but they can't modify it. 
or that you, they can use it, but they have to give you credit that you created it, you know, all kinds of things in the Creative Commons. So there's a lot of that stuff in the courts now, starting with John Deere mm -hmm. and their software. Do you know where that is at? I don't. No. No, I don't. Uh, GNU, or <clears throat> the GNU, uh, GPL, public license, that's what that looks like. Do we actually need to know the different types of no. licenses, just that there are open source licenses and you don't need to know the BSD and the GNU? You will need to know BSD and, and GPL. You'll need to know that those are... If, yeah, if it's on that okay. slide, you'll need to know it. Okay. Yeah. And if you, you know, if you do decide to do, like software development is kind of fun. I kind of wish I was a software de software developer because it's creative. It's kind of addicting, but there's just not enough time to do it. Because if you created software, you would put, you would want to put a license on it, so people knew crystal clear what what your intention was for the software. You know. All right, so application development models. This is the waterfall. It's been around for a long time. The number one thing to remember about the waterfall is it's linear and there's no iteration. So it's one way. And that's one of the reasons why it's never used. I don't know if it's ever been used, to be honest with you, in real world. Usually it's a, that's what the waterfall model looks like. So you start with the requirements, define what it is we're going to be doing, what the software is going to do, whatever, go into design, implementation, verification, maintenance. There are other waterfall methods that have more steps in it. The thing to remember about waterfall is you see there's no arrow back up. So if I had an error or a problem in the design phase, so what? Right? That's why it doesn't work. Instead, you have the modified waterfall. So the modified waterfall will allow you to iterate back up, but it only allows you to iterate one step up uh, in the true you know, modified waterfall model. That's a little more applicable. I've seen people try to implement that, but most people now are doing agile or stream programming, something else. But you could do that. Uh, and that's important to know for the, the test. The sashimi model, which is uh, like a layered model, but the layers don't line up specifically. They kind of, I'll show you a picture. That's what, the, that's what it looks like, the sashimi it's model. Like, like the food. Yeah, and it's layered kind of. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if anybody uses this either, but it's a model that might be on the test. The spiral model. Now this looks like the snail. So here you start in the middle, and it, and you iterate around and around and around. In every cycle, you're doing a risk assessment. Not a not the security risk assessment. Security might be part of it, but it's a risk analysis. Is this still viable? thing, um, stuff like that. So, um, yeah, and this is what it looks like. So you start you start kind of in that middle part, and then you just kind of spiral out. And as you're spiraling out, you have certain things, certain checkpoints that you're doing. Uh, but the important thing to remember about the spiral model is that there's a risk analysis at every cycle. Agile, or is it, yeah, it's going to be stupid. I was going to say Agile, but that sounds stupid. I don't even know why I said it. At least you caught yourself. No, I know, but then I did it anyway. Well, yeah. I'm such an idiot. Give me a coffee. Why don't we take a break when we're supposed to? All right, Agile. So it's both, both Scrum and Extreme Programming are Agile software development. The point with Agile is to not inundate ourselves with a bunch of formality and a bunch of uh, documentation and all of that. It's to get things through pretty quickly, right? Uh, so it is an agile framework. It can go with the flow pretty quickly. We're trying to work on, uh, I was talking to uh, Yvonne, who leads our development team here. We're on a two-week cycle, release cycle. So every two weeks they release, so that those are called sprints. So they'll do a two-week sprint and then release in two weeks, two weeks. He wants to get it down to, he wants, he's, he's out there a little bit. Uh, he wants to do daily releases. Get to a point where we're doing daily, but small, 
small yeah. incremental daily releases so that you can identify if you're not wasting yeah, a bunch of problem. right and you're not wasting a bunch of coding time thinking that the that that That's the end point. user wanted this you can you'll get it quicker and then you know be able to back those things out you were just telling me about that this morning Scrum, so Scrum is like a Scrum team. You have a Scrum master, and you have the end user all involved in that. Extreme programming has a real detailed specification to it. Uh, it's pairs of programmers that are working off of that detailed specification. And we're going to get through both of those here in a minute. The Agile Manifesto, if you want to read it, this is kind of, you know, you have to be a developer if you're calling things manifesto. I mean, who I never call it, I never call it a manifesto. Developers would. Developers are different. They like manifestos. Did you guys all watch, uh, speaking, for some reason I'm thinking of uh, Game of Thrones. Did you guys read it, watch that? No, I didn't. I haven't watched a single episode. I have no idea. I can't, I couldn't ruin something for you if I wanted to. But I, it was such a big deal. Now it just finished yesterday, right? And it's a big thing. And I asked people that watched it, I said, just rate it on a scale of 1 to 10. Uh, 10 being like it was the best episode ever. Yeah, most people said four or five. I was like, hmm. So it didn't go out with a big bang, it sounds like. But I wonder how many people drank the HBO today. Oh, yeah, I wonder. But I'm thinking about going to, you know, you can get them, get the recordings, right? So if I wanted to watch them, if I wanted to binge. You can do the HBO subscription or whatever. Yeah, I might binge it at some point because I'm so out of the loop with every, I mean, most people I know have seen it, and they talk about it, and I'm like, dude, I have no idea what you're talking about. It was, is it worth it, do you think? You guys have watched it? Is it worth going? I've been binging it. I'm on season five. Season five? How many seasons are there? Six? Eight. Eight? Eight. Yeah. I find the time. Did you watch it? No. See, if you guys didn't, then maybe I won't. All right, forget it. At least we could hang out. <laughs> All right, Man Agile Manifesto. So if you want to go read it, that's what it is. That's what sort of drives this movement. Um, it's a good movement. I mean, it's there's good quality software being made every, you know, lots of places. So Scrum is one uh, agile development model, uh, like rugby. If you ever watch rugby, have you ever watched rugby? Yeah. Try to figure out what the hell they're doing. It's first great. couple, first a couple times you watch, it's like I don't know. I think somebody scored. I, I don't know what the hell. My and then my because my son played played in college, and uh, first couple of games I was like, I, you won. I mean, I, you have more numbers on the board than the other team does, so I think that's pretty cool. Because you know, they, you don't know like yeah, just different rules. But it's named after uh, the sport of rugby. Uh, small teams, developers called the scrum team. You have the scrum master who sort of organizes and keeps buddy people on task. <clears throat> You would have typically a, a scrum environment would have sprints as well. So you're managing to, you know, these sprints. And then you have the product owner who's the one who is, you know, at the end of the day is signing off on stuff. That's all you need to know for scrum. Extreme programming, the number one thing to remember about extreme programming is pairs of programmers, pairs of developers working together. High level of customer involvement, detailed specifications. That, that in and of itself usually slows the development cycle down, is creating those detailed specifications before you go off and, you know, develop stuff. Uh, core practices, planning, paired programming, 40-hour work week, 40-hour work week. I should be a developer. I should totally be a developer. That would be nice, wouldn't it? When's the last time you worked a 40-hour work week? Last week. For real? What do you do? Network administrator. Oh, yeah. I remember. I used to be one of those. <laughs> yeah. You could tell. You could, back in the day, in the late 90s, early 2000s, you could tell who were the best network guys and the best system admins because they weren't working. You'd set stuff up. I played... 10,000 games of ping pong with my friend Quan, who is an application developer. 
like 10,000 because you'd set things up and they'd work, right? There wasn't much changes back in the day. So th that's probably why you're only working a 40 hour work week. You're good at you're good at network administrating. 40 hour work week, total customer involvement, detailed test procedures, often called unit tests. So that's extreme programming. Any questions on that? Replication application development is get it from mock-up really to you know production as quickly as possible. Uh, prototypes, I called it a mock-up. <coughs> Dummy GUIs back in. So and a lot of these, a lot of times these will blend too. Like in our own application development here, we'll do prototypes. We'll do a lot of prototypes, dummy GUIs to show this is conceptually how we're thinking about designing the software. Does it fit? And Developers we'll, say they're doing GUIs for dummies though. Oh yeah. That you want to make GUIs for dummies. If the GUI's not intuitive enough, intuitive enough for the dumbest of your users, <laughs> it's not it's not good enough. Uh, Backend database is more okay. Goal is get it out as quickly as possible uh, to meet specific business needs. Technical concerns are secondary. Yeah, heavily involved it in every step of the process. A lot of times you'll use Rapid application development for developers who are writing code for themselves too. So it's really easy for them to be heavily involved in the process. They're the ones that are going to be using whatever it is they're developing. Prototyping is just uh, continually refining, 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 refining until you get to, you know, kind of the last thing. Lots of mock-ups, lots of design, uh, lots of pictures. That's what Yvonne's doing right now, mm -hmm. the new crisis score on Security Studio. It's all mock-ups, right? So it's trying to show the concepts and, and trying to translate what we whiteboarded into the next step, which is, does it look like this? Is this right? And then it'll be following up the code. That's prototyping. That's uh, just a diagram of a rapid application development, you know, using iterative prototyping. It'll just keep cycling until you're, until you're done. Actually, you're never done. But <clears throat> systems development lifecycle. Now, this is the formality of things with, uh, with uh, software development. As security people, we like some formality, right? We like to know at what points are you doing what types of testing, you know, whether it be unit tests, whether it be uh, integration testing, whether it be regression testing, you know, end user testing, security testing. Because if you don't get those things into a development lifecycle, they end up not happening, right? So, I mean, types of testing that we typically want to do is either static or dynamic testing. Static testing would be source code review. Remember that? We talked about that. Reviewing source code. I can use manual source code review or I can use tools like uh, what's, what's a good one? Barricode potentially to do source code analysis. Maybe my application is is that critical that I need to do source code analysis as part of the system development life cycle. Or uh, you know dynamic testing once it's getting close to production, you know we don't have uh, uh, SQL injection errors, you know, on the input, you know, whatever, whatever types of testing need to be done, that would all be go into your system development lifecycle. So it's the same process followed every time. It then becomes kind of a checklist. Uh, usually you have a QA person, right? Developers aren't the ones that are going to be QAing your software. They're going to, you're going to have another team that's probably going to be doing QA. You don't want developers putting code from the test environment into the production environment. You don't want developers having compilers in the production environment. You don't want developers withstanding access to the production environment. So all those things need to be somewhere. We would typically put those in the system development lifecycle so that you've got kind of the requirements for software development, getting it from here to there, and then eventually to where it dies. Uh, so SDLC focuses on security in every phase. So for the exam, you'd have security checkpoints. Now, yeah, that's important. And security has to be done right in practice. If you're going to put security in every part, you can't get in the way. If you start getting in the way of the software development 
practice or process, uh, they won't invite you to your meetings anymore. You know, so you just have to be careful when you're working with software developers. Uh, so NISTSP 800-14, this one's been withdrawn. Uh, but this is what it had in it, operational, and it probably still could be on the exam. Uh, operation maintenance, disposal, it's got the whole steps. Did I delete a slide? I did delete a slide. What are the other four steps? There's like four more steps. I think there's six steps. So just make a note that there are six steps. I can't remember what the other four are. It seems like there's six steps in. Implementation, development, acquisition. Yeah. Initiation and repair security. Okay. So what page, is, all listed there. what page is that? 444 and 445. All right. So on page 444, 445 has the rest of the steps that I don't have in, in the slide deck. I just knew that there was more to it. All right. Uh, so this is not testable, but if you want a really good resource, OWASP is a really good resource. They do have a secure software development lifecycle, so it's an SSDLC. And they've got some good resources, including uh, assessment tools. You can assess your own development process to see you know, how secure it is, how, what parts should you have that you don't. It's actually really good stuff there. I don't know. Um, we, we've used it before in our own practice, right? consulting companies, too. OWASP is uh, Open Web Application Security. Project, yes. They're got, testing them. They got all kinds of good stuff there. That's not test testable, but it is good practical resource. There's just an example life cycle phases. This does come from the Department of Justice software development life cycle. Not necessarily testable, but it does it is does give you good context of what things you would want in a software development life cycle. So it talks about all the way from the ideation or whatever at the beginning, all the way through to disposition when you're decommissioning and getting rid of the software. Our software escrow again, I think we talked about this already, but there it is again, put source code in escrow and you can only get it out under certain contractual you know, obligations, I guess. Why you would do that? Uh, code repository security. So, so you're going to keep your source code somewhere, and where you keep it is GitHub just got hacked. Last, no, a couple weeks ago. Not really. Well, I mean, hack. Yeah, but they just compromised single factor authentication on some repositories. So then, the attackers were taking the source, actually locking developers out of their own source code. So they're holding their source code ransom. Right. Uh, so be careful how you're securing your, your source code. Two-factor authentication, you know, this is some critical information, not only because, you know, you're developing an application, so you need the source code if you want to continue to develop the application, but also attackers can insert things into your source code that you didn't know, right? So now there's a, a backdoor potentially in your code. To every Juniper router in the world, maybe. Right, exactly. <laughs> Because if you have, you know, tens of thousands, maybe a couple hundred thousand, or maybe a million lines of code in your application, you're probably not going to notice somebody putting some. We've seen that happen in, in open source software. I can't remember. What was that one? Do you remember what I'm talking about? There was that open source software where, oh, crap. The original developer transferred oh, uh, uh, maintenance of the software to another and like almost immediately there were yeah this is not we talked about it in the podcast yeah so what ended up happening yeah. is the new maintainer of the software inserted back doors into the software and the software was was a uh, library that was used by lots of other software developers in their code to do things right including a lot of commercial software yeah so then it ended up creating back doors into uh, i think it was bitcoin wasn't it? It was like that's what was targeted. It was wallets. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. It was yeah. But that was the source code repository where they the original creator of the source code transferred maintenance. You know, so now there was a new maintainer of the source code, uh, and that new maintainer 
like sweet, you know, obviously malicious, put, you know, backdoor in, compromised a bunch of systems. Uh, so public third-party code repositories such as GitHub, uh, yeah, excellent publishing private code, uh, excellent publishing API security is really big right now, application programming interface security, where people are exposing, either Everything. exposing too much. So an API is like just like a doorway, right? It's something that you can write your code to to either pull data or pull, push data usually. It's a pull-push kind of thing. Uh, but if you expose too much of, too much data, right? Um, and I've also seen people publish um, inadvertently uh, API keys, mm -hmm. you know, private keys, keys that were, were supposed to be used for encrypting the stream, you know. So anyway, uh, excellent publishing private code as public is a common mistake made by developers. That would suck. <laughs> your private code that, you know, maybe you're even an application development company, you accidentally push the code out to a public repository. Ooh, crap. This includes accidentally publishing code that includes passwords or private keys, lists of security controls. Yeah, all stuff that we've talked about before, the system security itself, operational security, Operational security, meaning how you're going to maintain it <coughs> operationally day by day, stuff like that, software security, communications. It's a good story on page 440 of the book. I'm not going to re review it for you now, but that's all important stuff. Security of APIs. Well, there you go. Application programming interfaces. That's a programming interface. It's something another developer can write code to to interact with your application. Usually it's a data transfer uh, bit. There's an OWASP uh, API security project, which another good a bunch of resources. Uh, there's tons of good research on the internet now. Of uh, that, I was just talking to a researcher today who is doing specific research on API. Alyssa Knight, A L I S S A K N I G H T. She's uh, really good. Um, she's Wired Magazine, she's doing mm. a bunch of uh, API security stuff. But it's really easy to accidentally expose API stuff. Another really important reason why you'd want to have really extensive testing on anything I'm going to expose to anybody, right? Software change and configuration management. Uh, the exam treats configuration management and change management as separate but related disciplines. So kick configuration management. So the way we, t we talked before about um, having hardened builds. So having a server configured according to a hardened baseline build. So I had mentioned uh, uh, CSI, no, CIS. Yeah, it's a different TV show. Yeah, I know. <laughs> CIS controls, I mentioned STIGs, remember DOD, STIGs. Those are configuration guidelines to <coughs> harden servers, right? Reduce the attack service, make it more difficult for, the, for those things to be compromised. So the way to do configuration management the right way is to define your own baseline configuration. So you might start with the CI, CIS controls or CIS benchmark and find that, you know, you need to customize it and tweak it a little bit, and then you harden that build, right? Or not harden, you... you uh, Gold image, maybe, that build. So that build is now set. So then, theoretically, any deviation, any configuration change that you see that deviates from that build that isn't in change control is an incident, right? I mean, that's that would be the right way to do it. So that's configuration management. So any change in configuration, I should see. So when I go and do an audit, maybe annually, uh, and I scan the system and I look for the configuration and the configuration was A and now it's B. Theoretically, if we have a good change control process and we did it right, I should see a series of tickets or something that documents why that deviation occurred. Would you agree? Because if not, then it's, a, it's an unauthorized modification if I've got it written that way. And unauthorized either meaning it was malicious, an attacker, or inadvertent, or lazy, right? Somebody didn't want to go through change control, stuff like that. So that's why configuration management is a big deal because vulnerability management isn't the same as patch management. 
right? Vulnerability management. You usually have technical vulnerabilities that come in one of two flavors. It's either a missing patch, software update, or a configuration error. So we configured it crappy. So configuration management really is a big deal. Um, and software change is as big a deal, probably harder, probably a little um, easier than actually configuration management because that's a fully auditable process, which is difficult for people to implement, but it'd be ideal if you can do it. Software change in configuration management, more stuff. There's another NIST special publication. I don't think you'll have to memorize that one. It's just there more for reference because 800-128 isn't one that we reference very often. Uh, configuration management plan, so a CM plan would be called for in that special publication. Uh, and these are the things that you'd have there. Configuration control board, that gets, how many people, you guys have all have configuration control boards? <laughs> Probably not. But... Because usually you, you wouldn't go quite that formal, right? But the government would have a configuration control board probably. Uh, but it's just somebody who's going to control or own or maintain the configurations and uh, authorize changes to them. Configuration uh, item identification, configuration change control, and configuration monitoring. Those would all be part of maintaining the, the configuration management system, which is sort of what I explained, right? You have that baseline. The configuration control board or IT or somebody defines what that standard is going to be. And then any changes to that would, you know, when we're going through changes, what item are you changing? Are you changing, adding a new service, you know, whatever, right? What changes are you making to the server or the system? And then going through the change control process, and then you have to have that monitoring at the end. You want to really change control doesn't, you really don't. Uh, get the full uh, benefit of change control unless you're auditing against it. Because you just don't know what unauthorized changes have occurred, right? I mean, it does still slow people down from just making willy-nilly changes to the environment, but the full benefit comes from doing it auditably. DevOps, so DevOps is for all about sec separation of duties. Segregation of duties is what DevOps is about. Uh, developers, quality assurance, teams and production teams, DevOps is the operations of all of that together. How do those things integrate? Uh, what are the rules going to be? What are the roles? You know, everybody's got specific things. That's all DevOps. Object-oriented design and programming. So two different things, object-oriented programming and object-oriented design. And it's pretty self-explanatory. Design is how you design the application using object-oriented principles. The programming would be coding it. Uh, an object metaphor, so objects are, you know, just think of uh, putting together a program as being a, a bunch of objects that have to all work together. And in, the reason why you do objects is because I, I can reuse code. Uh, I can also encapsulate data, so uh, ob obfuscate data. Um, makes it easier to compartmentalize the application. You know, a bunch of different reasons why, you know, you go object-oriented. And but most code today, most compiled code today is object-oriented. Make sense? And one's just design and one's programming. More things about object-oriented programming. It treats the program as a series of connected objects. So we'll talk a little bit about connect the connected. There's, it's co called cohesiveness. Uh, cohesiveness and coupling uh, with, with objects. Uh, it's just how reliant they are on other objects for their functioning. Some objects are uh, fairly cohesive, so they don't need other objects to do a lot of things. Um, other ones are highly coupled. They do have, they're just needy little things, needy little projects that need other projects to just validate that they're okay. <laughs> Low self-esteem objects, I like to think of them as abused objects. <laughs> There's all kinds of them. Uh, attempts to model the real world examples, uh, C++, Java, Smalltalk, Ruby, those are all object-oriented programming languages. The black box is just the ability to encapsulate the data so that other objects, you may not want to expose the data. It, you know, sometimes it makes a little higher security. It also makes it, uh, maybe your, your program uh, a little more 
uh, simple, right? Because I only need to share what I need to share. I've just contained two things, data and methods. The methods are the things that it does, what it's been programmed to do. The data is data. Uh, then I talked about encapsulation, that stuff. Object-oriented programming concepts. So these are things that you'll need to know. Uh, objects themselves, methods, which is really just programming language, functions, uh, the things that the object actually does is its methods. Uh, messages is, you know, between objects. They need to communicate with each other and sometimes even application, you know, inter-application messages. Inheritance uh, it would be, you know, I inherited something from another object, some characteristics or, you know, methods. Delegation, just delegating to another object, certain functions, methods. Polymorphism is the the ability for an object to change um, over time. And poly polyinstantiation is for objects to appear multiple times in the same program. It's multiple instances of the object. Those are what those mean. And they've got definitions there. So you'll need to memorize that probably. Yeah, no, probably. You will. You will. There's uh, an object, and you can see, you know, an object can have that object on the right as, in this example, as four objects, and then the data. And another object sends messages. It's that simple. It can get confusing quick, but that's that's simple. Coupling and cohesion are those two concepts I mentioned a little bit earlier. A highly coupled object requires lots of other objects to perform basic jobs. It's a very needy little object. Uh, objects with high cohesion are far more independent. It's like an Evan object. <laughs> I grew up an only child. I'd sit in a room by myself with a ball and a paper clip for hours. I'm high they learned to pick locks. Yeah, I'm a high cohesion object. So the cohesions are always within the same module? Uh, I wouldn't. They're not necessarily. Well, the module, the module names there are objects. I mean, no, that's not true. Uh, modules are containers for the objects in, in that diagram. Uh, so what was the question? Well, it looks like the cohesions are always within a module. It doesn't oh, that doesn't module. necessarily have to be true. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, the biggest things to remember is coupled and cohesion. Cohesion is kind of independent. Uh, highly coupled means it needs others to do basics. Right, object request broker. So an object request broker is like a search engine for objects. Because uh, sometimes um, an object or an application doesn't know where to find another application or another object. So we'd use an or put an object request broker to find those things. The only three that you need to even associate with this are COM, DCOM, and CORBA. COM and DCOM are both Microsoft specific. COM is on the local computer. It's like a search engine on the local computer looking for objects. DCOM is distributed communication or component object model, which is between computers. That'd be over a network, right? And CORBA is open source. That's the big, the biggest differences between these three that you'll need to know. You don't need to know the, all the details of how these work. Just know that COM and DCOM are Microsoft, COM local, DCOM distributed, CORBA is open source, or not open source, yeah, open source. Make sense? Object request brokers. There's an orb for you. Uh, so you got a client application, it needs to communicate with a remote object. If it's a remote service, that would be a distributed component object model type, or CORBA fits that too. Uh, yeah, it just, it's that, that broker, that search engine for where to find those objects. We're about CORBA, Open Vendor Neutral Network Object Broker Framework by the Object Management Group. It competes with Microsoft's proprietary DCOM, so you only find DCOM on Microsoft systems. Uh, if you want to know more about CORBA, it's there. Uh, and then I got a nice little diagram. That's what it looks like over a network. So you see server machine, client machine, you've got the, the socket. Do you know what a socket is? 
IP address and port number. IP address and port number. That's your socket. Uh, the object request broker runs on top of that. Um, so a server, uh, we'll start with a client. Uh, I need an object. I need whatever the app, whatever's been programmed in the application. I need to communicate with a web service, whatever. Uh, it would use that object request broker to, to find the object. It wouldn't be a web service. It'd be a web component. Make sense? And you think I don't have to develop any of this stuff. We can just keep this. It's good enough. Object-oriented analysis and object-oriented design. The two things here, when you think analysis, think pro uh, problems, problem solving. The object-oriented analysis is all about pro problem solving. The object-oriented design is the solution, the design solution for the problem. That's the difference between analysis and design here. Uh, drawing a flow chart on a white board shows the program should conceptually operate. Uh, yeah, analyze a problem. That's that's good enough. I was I've always just kept those two separate with analysis, meaning analysis of what, analysis of the problem, design is the solution for the problem. Vulnerabilities, so software vulnerabilities, so this isn't technical vulnerabilities, this is a software vulnerability, uh, slightly different. Now the reference in the book, is the book reference actually 2011? Top 25? Pro probably. There's newer than that. But these are the most, but actually not a lot of these have changed. Yeah. If you look over the years, these are pretty much yeah, they haven't really pretty static. So the most dangerous software errors, uh, SANS top 25, hard-coded credentials, buffer overflow. Uh, so, so buffer overflows happen because uh, there's not bounds checking. So you can overflow the memory buffer assigned to the application or the process and spill over into another application process, which might be running, other, and where you'd probably you'd try to execute your code. So you can execute code as the process that you smashed. Smash the stack, sometimes they'll call it. Uh, the buffer overflows, it's a programming error where the programmer, because like uh, C Sharp, I don't think has built-in bounds checking. So you'd have to specifically program that. If you forgot it, then you'd be susceptible to uh, buffer overflow. SQL injection is kind of the same sort of concept, but a SQL injection is usually in a form with a backend database. I can, there's no constraints of what I can put in that form, so sometimes I can even put SQL commands in that form and, and check that. Uh, directory tra path traversal, so this is me being able to put, you know, like a CD, that's what that dot dot backslash dot dot, it'd be like a change directory. That's how that would be interpreted. That would be a directory traversal. So if I'm in the, the, the www root directory, I can back out of that directory and go into potentially another directory where I can find something else to run. That's what that attack or vulnerability is. Um, it's just sloppy coding, really. But that it's those types of things that you'd want to test, right? When I talk about your software development lifecycle, you would certainly want the top 25 most dangerous kind of things tested because the attackers all know this. They're testing it when you put it in production for sure. Um, yeah. So time of check, time of use or race conditions. This is, you know, essentially in the time it takes for the computer to check, you know, check off, check whether you're authorized, check authentication, check whatever. In the time that it's doing that, by the time it gets back to your program and your program issues the command under that context, the attacker has inserted other code to run under your context. Does that make sense? So yeah, you're authorized to do it and the attacker slides something in really quick before your uh, your application can get back to it. And there's just a, an example. It's a, it's a legit, it's a legit, you know, easy to follow example. It's basically what I just said. Uh, disclosure. So this is when I find a vulnerability, 
there's different ways to disclose the vulnerability so that it gets fixed. There's full disclosure and reasonable disclosure. And, you know, I think to go one way every time is difficult because different circumstances kind of require different approaches. Uh, full disclosure is typically I'm going to disclose it to the world. I'm not going to give the application, I'm not going to give the developer uh, a chance to fix it before I'm going to tell everybody about it. Sometimes people do that to brag. It's bragging rights, you know. I'm big man on the block because I found this vulnerability, woohoo, and can you cause a big stir for everybody else? Uh, reasonable disclosure, I, if I were to err on one way, I would go the reasonable route. Give the application developer, like Microsoft or whoever's got the bug, give them an opportunity to fix it first, issue a patch. <clears throat> there are times, though, where it goes on for months and months and months, and they don't issue a patch. They ignore you. Well, then maybe it's time to go full disclosure, you know, report it. Even if I were to report it full disclosure, I'd probably do it under a... Uh, a moniker, I wouldn't do it under, you know, my name. I wouldn't want to be associated with it just because I don't want to be associated with it. Panera Bread was a good example of that one. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. See, that was a reasonable disclosure. The attacker went to Panera, went to the CISO and said, hey, you know, I got this thing, blah, 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 blah. And the CISO was like, just ignored him completely. So the guy or gal went, all right, and full disclosure. And uh, I assume the Panera Bread guy is out of a job. But we get inundated with emails all the time. I mean, I can see where he's coming from. I mean, you get emails all the time. Oh, yeah. People want to sell you stuff. Oh, my God. Calls. I mean, I 30 calls today, maybe, of just crap calls. There's kind of one in between there, too. Oh, it was the, partial. Which one? Well, I was going to say, like, the bug bounty programs where oh, yeah. they have their own. Like the, the fun of cross-site scripting mm -hmm. flaw on your site. Yeah. They want money before they'll disclose it. Yeah, yeah. Well, if it's a bug bounty, then, yeah, I'm entitled to money if I find it, right? I mean, that was well, part of, that's part of the game. Depends on how that works. If they're, they're, some is bug bounty where they're reporting because there's a reward, basically. But others are, we found something on your site. If you don't pay us, we're going to disclose Oh, extortion? It. Yeah. Yeah, that's illegal. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I don't think you can do that legally. Well, no. right, but somewhere I'm gonna have to send this. Uh, I suppose I could do Bitcoin, but now you can track Bitcoin pretty well too. There's some good forensic stuff. For I don't know. Yeah, I don't like people that do that crap, take advantage of other people. You know, pay me fifty grand or I'm gonna full disclose it. Yeah. Like, hold on, let me hit record. Say, say it again, please. <laughs> So at least when you do do the full disclosure, because I'm not going to pay you the fifty thousand dollars, at least I have evidence of why I didn't. <laughs> you know, so I don't. Right. Know. All right. So databases, data by uh, database. You know what a database is, right? It's a structured collection of data. Uh, there's different types of databases. The most common type of database is the relational database, uh, but here's other kinds. The hierarchical model. And actually, when I say the most common, maybe it's the hierarchical model. DNS is a hierarchical mm -hmm. database uh, where you've got, you know, the dot, then com, edu, blah, blah, blah. It's a hierarchical database structure. Um, relational databases are very common. Um, flat file database, that'd be like an Excel, potentially. Uh, but these are all different databases. Most common modern database is the relational database, two-dimensional tables. So you've got rows and columns. Uh, that's the relational piece of it. Table is also called a, rel a relation. Um, so a database can, can and does usually contain multiple tables. And there's also a relation between tables. So it's a multi-dimensional multi relation. So a relation in the table itself, but then the relationship between tables. And that relationship between tables, that's where primary key becomes you know, really important. Uh, if we want database integrity, uh, tables have rows and columns. A database a row is a database record called a tuple, which I think is, I don't like that word, but it is what it is. Tuple, a column is called an attribute. A single cell intersection is called the value. Uh, 
you have to have a unique value in each tuple in a table. That's the primary key. Uh, relational database sort of sorted by the primary key. Uh, this is just an example. I think there's a picture there. So it wouldn't make sense to use name or title as the primary key because they're not um, unique. Social security number should be unique in this database, so that would be our primary key. That's really what this is communicating. A foreign key is in a related database table, so this is going to be multiple tables. This would be the, the other dimension uh, where the table, the primary key matches in both. That's the relation. The foreign key is the primary, same as the primary key. There, that's the relation between the two tables. Referential integrity means that the, there's no duplication here, that that integrity of the primary key and foreign key is maintained in the database. Uh, a lot of database, databases like current databases won't allow you to violate referential integrity. Uh, semantic integrity, uh, this would be, so I've assigned certain values to um, value types. It's like maybe it's a text, it's an integer, it's a whatever. Um, Semantic integrity is where we violated that. Try to store a number in uh, or an integer in a text uh, field. Entity integrity, uh, each tuple has a unique primary key that's not null. So you can't even have a table if you don't have a primary key in a database. And it can't be nothing, it can't be blank. That's, that's the entity integrity. Make sense? All right. Database normalization. Really, the the key the keyest point for database normalization is making the database uh, organized, concise. Really, it's not really compacting it, but it is uh, making it um, all the relations optimized. Really makes it the database run faster. Moving redundant data. Proving integrity, those are the normalization steps. So three rules called norms. The first normal form, divide data into tables. Second normal form, move data that is partially dependent on the primary key to another table. And the third normal form, remove data that is not dependent on the primary key. That'd be that redundant data piece. Now, do you remember in the exam if you have to know those forms? I can't remember. I remember memorizing them. I don't remember if it was in the exam or not. All right. If it's in the exam, you'll probably lose it. And you didn't memorize it, you'll lose, yeah, I would you'll lose one answer. So is memorizing that worth one answer? Potentially. Potentially. I don't even know if it's true. I don't yeah. know. Database tables may be queried. Uh, the results of a query are called the database view. Views, uh, you can do all kinds of things. that. So we would constrain views, and that's how we control you know, security to the database, at least the confidentiality, be the constrained user interface. Data dictionary, uh, description. So this is metadata, really. Uh, not really metadata, except if it was metadata, it would be data about the data. It's just data about the database, really, is the data dictionary. Description of the database tables, uh, metadata, data about the data, I guess. Contains database view information, all that stuff. Uh, the data dictionary would, would the data dictionary uh, include the schema? Yeah, yeah, okay, yep, yeah. in this schema. Not Suchima, it's truly schema. All right, let's get done, we're almost done. Database query languages, uh, SQL is kind of the king, uh, structured query language, way back 74, IBM created uh, SQL. You've got the data definition language and the data manipulation language. The data definition language is creating, modifying tables themselves. The data manipulation language is manipulating the actual data. So you can see some of the, uh, although I don't have the commands here, but like uh, creating tables would be a, a data definition language function. Adding data to the table would be a data manipulation language function. Uh, all in SQL. There's a bunch of different kinds of SQL or flavors of SQL, implementations of SQL, but it, 
they're all based in the original language. Uh, database yeah. query languages, so creating a table, that'd be a DDL. Uh, selecting uh, a record, that'd be a data manipulation language command. So you can see what these are. And these are common ones. So create, select, delete, insert, update. Drop is a fun one. Try it on your database. Just kidding, don't. <laughs> the Johnny drop tables? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hierarchical database, we talked about trees. That's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, Object-oriented databases are databases that can contain objects. So they can contain actual programming language, which then makes it much more dynamic. Uh, most databases, most relational databases, just contain data. Uh, but here we've, you know, in an object-oriented database, you can combine data with methods and functions so that you, it does something. Uh, it gets a little funky. Then database replication and database shadowing, we talked about that. Replication would mean it's just replicated. It's not, you know, shadowed. It's not live necessarily. I'm sorry, it is live. Data replication is they're being used at the same time. Shadowing means that they, the database is just being copied to. Data warehousing and data mining, just big, huge tons of data. It's a data warehouse. Data mining is how to... Uh, find what you want in that data warehouse. AI, artificial intelligence. So we're just going to stick to these basic things and then we'll, we'll be done with the entire book. Uh, expert systems. So the thing about expert systems is it's just a bunch of if-then if statements and it follows a tree. Uh, it builds a knowledge base, so you, it learns. Uh, this kind of system would, would learn, it would build a knowledge base, a bunch of if-then statements, and then follow the tree to make decisions. And based on the decisions, it would feed back on itself and update the knowledge base would be, again. So the integrity of the knowledge base is critical in an expert system, forming that logical tree, uh, and you know, doing those if-then statements. That's the biggest thing. Artificial neural networks try to act like the human brain. Uh, Again, it's a, so there it's a bunch of synapse, conceptual synapses. So it's trees connecting to sort of other trees and then firing those things. Uh, that's the, the concept anyway. Uh, Multi-layer neural networks. This is where it gets, there's no limit to the number of layers you can build with an artificial neural network. It can get really, really, really funky really fast with these. Uh, do you remember? No, oh, there was a like, dude. We had a guy in here who was, oh, he built AIs that built AIs. About this. Smartest cat I've ever seen in my entire life. The dude was just like, ah, I can't even, he was just crazy. And he had this twitch though. He had to twirl his hair all the time. So he twirls hair the whole time he's talking to you, but he's talking like a million miles a minute about how ANNs work, artificial neural networks work and how he builds them and it's just crazy. Lots and lots of math in an artificial neural network. And really, none of, no AIs really, the, an AI works better with more data. So, uh, because that data, uh, it's just the same way you, you learn things. The more data, the better decisions it can make, right? And normally, a, artificial neural networks, you'll go into it with a specific problem that you want to solve. So if you haven't figured out what problem you want to solve, you're not going to do any, I mean, your AI is not going to work, right? So that's another thing that people sort of miss with artificial neural networks. But anyway, that's good enough for an artificial neural network. Uh, how they operate, replicate the capabilities of biological neural networks, a node, artificial neuron. Yeah, single, single layer, and then those multi-layer ones. It gets really weird. That's good enough for it. Artificial neural networks there. Uh, training functions, synaptic weights are changed via an iterative process. So that's all going to require data. You know, the more data, so it'll try this, try that, didn't work, more data, try this, try that, more data. Uh, Google has an AI that, that works pretty well that can tell different images from each other. So like it can tell... Oh, that's a picture of a dog. Oh, that's a picture of a rabbit. 
Well, probably may not get that one right. Well, probably will. And the reason why I can do that is because they fed millions of image, images of dogs to the artificial neural network so that it's built enough pathways through the artificial neural network to be fairly certain that this is a dog, right, with some level of certainty. And it's all done with math. All this stuff runs on math. It's crazy. So there's the input units, hidden units, output units, the flow of activation. And that's, I mean, for the exam, you, you may see an example or a question on artificial neural networks, but it'll be so high level just like this. You don't have to get deep into it. Uh, Bayesian filtering. So Bayesian filtering, it, the big thing about Bayesian filtering is it's about probability. Bayesian is all about probability. So statistical methods, including simple mathematical formula, blah, blah, blah. The most common use of Bayesian is in identifying spam. These specific characteristics usually fit spam. So you'll see the scoring typically. Have you ever looked at an email header before? You see different scoring metrics and things like that. That's probably the, the, the Bayesian function working with that. Uh, genetic algorithms and programming, uh, I don't know what you'll need to know here. Probably just this. I mean, yeah, it, it, genetic programming. Really the is first one's the biggest one where it's basically replicating nature. Replicating nature. But this, this will also be, it's like all this, it'll be, a lot of it will be iterative. It yeah. learns, learns, learns. Yeah, they're, just like nature evolves, evolves, evolves. Yeah. <coughs> Breeding, solving code, mutations. Yeah. So think very, you know, as you're looking through it, it's well, things that you'd think of. Well, here the, the, the programs will actually channel. the programs will actually rewrite, be rewritten based on right what it's evolving to, which seems weird, but uh, yeah, more about that. The initial population of random computer programs. Execute each program in the pipeline, assign it a fitness value according to how well it solves the problem. Create a new population of computer programs, copy the best existing programs, create new computer programs by mutation. So you can see how it just continues to sort of evolve itself. Yeah, but you have to have a problem first. Not all these, you have to have a problem. That's it. Class 11, we're through the book. Any questions? If you're going to go. Can you repeat that? Six. What do we need to study? You need to study everything. Do you have a test that you should take for you? For, I don't know. We should create another. Oh, we're going to create a certification. He doesn't know it yet. Add it to the list. <laughs> All right, so we're done with the book. Uh, we'll do practice exams. I will be here Wednesday night, so Wednesday is, is still on. Uh, he won't be. He's yeah. celebrating his daughter's, My daughter's pretty, pretty sweet accomplishment. Yeah. What'd she do? She scored above average in the ACT for all 7th and 8th oh, graders yeah, in the Midwest. Yeah. Just, just a little bit. Thank, I'm just so, I was so glad I didn't take the ACT so she could, like, so she gave like a mother. Did she give like, like a twenty-five or something? And she, had, she had a nineteen in seventh grade. Yeah, nineteen with, with no that young, prep. So awesome. yeah, just it's cool. So he'll be gone. I won't be here. That on Wednesday, and uh, we'll just do practice questions. So come relaxed. Come with questions. If you are reading and you have questions about certain things that you're reading and you want clarification, come with those. Uh, and then the next class after that, which will kind of make just sort of a celebration, we'll still do a little bit of teaching and hanging out, but we'll try to do food. That one we'll have to figure out when it's going to work best, because I, I will be in New Jersey on the 29th. And so we may have to, we'll, we'll uh, have Brandon send out an email. Yeah, so we'll yeah, figure that out. Maybe like a June Wednesday or something. Yeah, June. Yeah, maybe June Wednesday. But now that we're done, so you've gone through all the content. And if this was your first pass through the book, like I told you when we started in class one, I went through the, a thicker book three times. So it's I think it's natural if it seems sort of overwhelming, go back and read the book again. Yeah. And then read it again. It's There's nothing wrong with that. And then I think you'll be, if you read the book three times 
and use some of the other setting materials that you saw on uh, on the Slack page or channel, um, and then practice exams, you'll totally be ready. But what I would really caution is like thinking, I'll just shelve this for a little while because this isn't time yet. You haven't actually accomplished anything yet. You know, I mean, you got to pass that exam and then relax. How much weight would you put in reading the class? About 220. <laughs> oh, not my way. In the, oh, so, I think it's good. Yeah, I would also look at the that sunflower study guide. So it'll have That's the yeah, it'll have the very similar glossary, but it's got what? Yeah, it's just a little easier way to look at it. It's in one of the emails Brandon sent. If it's, one too. I think if it's your first, there you go. I, I think it's a, if it's your first time through the book, I'd read the glossary. Yeah, because your oh, first yeah. time through the book is about just getting some uh, association between words and meanings. But that's it. We did it. We did it. Good. I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off if I can figure out what the mouse is. We're good. Good. No questions. All right. We're off. I got uh, two practice exams on Udemy for 